I'm David Kennedy, a law professor and director of the Institute for Global Law and Policy uh, at Harvard Law School, and I'm delighted the Rappaport Center has asked me to chair today's conversation. We have a wonderful panel, um, and it promises to be a very enriching discussion, but first some basic information about the Zoom meeting. It'd be great if you could ensure that your mics are muted so we don't get any feedback, although it's lovely to see everybody's face out there. Um, and as we go along, feel free to use the chat um, and have a conversation with whoever wants to join you in the chat. The only thing I'll say is that our panelists and I will not be watching the chat because we'll be having a panel. Uh, and so if you'd like to ask a question uh, to anyone, a member of the panel or generally, just send it to me as a personal message in the chat and I'll get it and I'll try to work it into our conversation. Okay, so for the, the panel, we have uh, just this great group of people. So we have an in alphabetical order and their bios are gonna be posted in the chat in full so that I won't um, read them all out here. Uh, Professor Helena Alviar uh, from Sciences Po Law School. Professor, for, Professor Jennifer Baer, who's a professor of sociology at the University of Virginia, where she actually also serves as department chair. And given what it's like to be a department chair, she'll be popping in when she can and joining the conversation as we go along. Professor Karen Engel, who is professor of law and co-director of the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Center for Human Rights and Justice at the University of Texas School of Law, and with whom, and it's with the Rappaport Center that the Institute for Global Law and Policy has collaborated in preparing for today's conversation. Uh, Sam Tabori, a PhD candidate at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. Professor Jen Jennifer Gordon is a professor of law at Fordham University School of Law. Uh, it's really an amazingly terrific group. Um, we also have uh, Vanya Hamzik, uh, who's a uh, professor, of, a reader actually in law, history and anthropology and associate director of research at SOAS in London. Uh, professor Neville Hode, an associate professor of English and co-director of the Rappaport Center with Karen Engel. And Professor Kerry Riddick, who's the professor of everything, it seems, professor of law, women and gender studies, public policy and governance at the University of Toronto. It's delightful to have all of you with us. So let me introduce the conversation a little bit by talking about the themes that animated us to get together and hold this roundtable discussion. There are themes that arose in conversations the Rappaport Center and the IGLP at Harvard have convened over the last couple of years, which have tried, as I guess the title for today's webinar suggests, to get beyond what have become common shorthand accounts of inequality, or even ask if, if inequality is the right frame for thinking about the world's great disparities in power, wealth, status, and so on. You know, you hear the word structural quite a bit these days, structural inequality, the structures of white supremacy and so on. And we tried to put some legs on that um, as legal scholars and sociologists. What is that structure? What is the structure and how does it reproduce inequalities and differences? Uh, we've gone back in order to figure that out. We've gone back to some intellectual traditions that we thought might help just with the diagnostics. Um, both how is subordination reproduced, how is it solidified, and also how can we look a little bit around the corner and see how inequalities are likely to evolve going forward. How much of the structure is institutional form? How much is shared ideas, either about an ideology of one kind or another, what we conventionally think about, or more general background ideas about how the world is organized, shared ways of imagining what's normal, what's contestable, how much inequality is okay, when does it become unsustainable or ethically intolerable, what's the frame within which those kinds of uh, senses of the problem emerge and themselves are reproduced. And I guess as all of us know, academic conversations have focused on inequality for more than a decade now. Um, and I guess we've all felt it's probably time for a second or even a third look. And for that, we thought we had to really go back to some basics and revisit some foundational texts. Foundational texts about racial stratification in the global economy, 
about the structures of global and economic political systems in general, um, as well as the intellectual traditions for exploring the distributional impact of legal, institutional, or ideological arrangements. But we also found out you can't go back to basics in the abstract. You need to have some material that you're working on, both a space to explore the potential usefulness of these traditions, but also to find cracks, places where, the, where interesting progressive possibilities might be opening. And work turns out to be great for this. There's a lot of talk now about the future of work. Um, technology is changing how people work, who can work, and so forth. And, that might seem like a great thing, or it might seem like a very scary thing. But if you're focused on inequality in the structural sense, lots of these contemporary conversations can seem misguided. And the further we got into this frame, the more we thought we really have to rethink this. Conventional conversations seem nostalgic for formal wage work and fail to capture the significance of informal work all over the global economy, as well as the looming potential of underemployment or non-waged work, perhaps even for a majority of the world's population. And conventional conversations about the future of work have a very kind of common sense idea about how the past flows into the future even as we're newly aware of the chaos, uncertainty, and multiplicity of the ways in which the present turns into the future for different people in different places. So to start us off, and before I turn to our panel to give us some sense of the studies that they've each individually done animated by these ideas, let me start off by asking Carrie Riddick, if you would, to just give us a deeper sense than I'm able to hear as a non-specialist for the conventional and the unconventional images of work and its future that have animated the overall conversations we've had. And I guess more specifically, Carrie, what law has to do with it? Carrie? Thank you, David, and, and deep thanks to uh, the organizers, Karen Engel and Neville Hope, uh, for thinking of having this wonderful project and uh, bringing us all together um, and uh, um, with all of you who are listening uh, to talk about the challenges of work. So let me just try and put a little bit of flesh on the bones um, that David has sketched out for us already. Uh, I'll start briefly with just the landscape of work itself and then try and put a spotlight on um, uh, the role of law in the past, present, and futures of life, of life and work, <laughs> um, and, and what, why we're in the midst of rethinking it, as David has outlined. Um, so as countless sociologists and labor scholars have now documented, um, uh, the landscape of work itself might be described as one in which various forms of precarious work are deeply normalized. Um, uh, uh, it's a landscape in which workers are seeing uh, flat or falling incomes, uh, the terms under which they perform their work are poor and uh, 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 progressively degraded, um, the returns to production are flowing more to capital than to labor, um, and workers are experiencing um, uh, the burden of risk of uh, business cycles of uh, shifts in economic policies. And uh, of course, there's lots of un and underemployment as well. Um, these phenomena are due to a series of other shifts in which the world of work itself is Im embedded. And, and um, uh, these shifts range from the rise of si supply chains and network production uh, to expanded competition among workers for work as a function of market integration and globalization, um, uh, uh, a world in which production itself is transnationalized. Um, a key one, one which I think most people are aware of on some level, which is the conversion of employment into contingent, often short-term contractual work, um, uh, uh, the destandardization and immense range of uh, 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 conditions under which people now work, which is itself, a result of uh, the fissuring uh, and fragmentation of work. And of course, we'd mention automation um, and declines in manufacturing, as well as new and innovative uses of algorithms to surveil workers to, and to manage them more closely. 
Okay, now, if that's the landscape of work, uh, what might we say about law's role here? Um, well, if the perennial role of labor law is to redress this imbalance of bargaining power between workers and capital, or at its most basic level, simply to make work better, it's failing miserably at this task. Um, so let me sketch out a couple of contrasting ideas. I'm gonna start with the mainstream way to think about this uh, 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 dilemma. And that would go roughly as, uh, uh, as follows. The idea would be that there's a gap in the reach of labor law. Uh, there are too many workers who fall outside of its net and uh, the primary task is simply to extend it to places where it's either missing or weak. And this is the project that animates a huge amount of institutional thinking and action um, around uh, bad work as present. And it also animates uh, uh, the imagined future of work. Uh, but there's another idea and one that I think everybody on this project embraces in different ways. And that is uh, to realign our thinking about the law of work, um, uh, what it is, uh, what it's for, and where we might find it. Um, and the idea here is uh, that we need uh, an expanded frontier, an expanded horizon, um, and uh, one that's more responsive to um, uh, the insights of, for example, racial capitalism and world systems theory, um, and at a more granular level that gives us some traction to better analyze the distribution of risk and power and resources at work. Um, all right, so I want to um, just say a word about the limits of labor law's gaze right now and some reversals that uh, might help us get over those limits and in fact, uh, connect up law with the broader conversations around distributive justice, uh, but also uh, um, racial capitalism and um, transnationalism. So the one observation would simply be that um, uh, labor law's gaze, the gaze of uh, uh, on work uh, uh, from the discipline that aims to regulate it is both particular and get over those limits. Oh. Um, and it's uh, in part due to um, its roots in the North Atlantic industrialized world. Um, as a result, it's full of biases, um, uh, a male bias, an employment bias, a national bias, and so forth. And it marginalizes or simply excludes large domains of work, like subsistence work, informal work, and uh, unpaid care domestic work. And so the general strategy that um, I am pursuing um, is to simply perform a series of reversals um, on the usual assumptions and to, for example, uh, um, imagine that informal work is not um, uh, um, an abnormal form of work, but in fact, it's normal and to take it as its reference point um, and ask about its legal infrastructure and its conditions of possibility. Um, so I don't want to take up much time, so I'm going to sketch very briefly three types of reversals that I think help bring us closer to a new frontier of analysis when it comes to work. Um, the first would be simply unpacking and abandoning uh, legal reform projects that imagine workers as simply undifferentiated, uh, decontextualized workers. Or, or to put it the other way around, uh, put the racially and socially encumbered worker at the center of analysis. So here, what, what we wanna do is reverse the assumption that it's the labor capital relationship that's always primary and uh, uh, that things like identity, whether racial or gender are just part of the social context rather than the deep structure of work. The second move would simply be to decenter wage work and de-exceptionalize the many forms of work that labor law now excludes or put it the other way around to recognize that employment and wage labor are just a subset of the larger field of work. Um, and two examples here would be uh, unpaid work and informal work. I've already mentioned that uh, uh, we could put informal work at the center of our analysis, um, not only to see it as normal work, but to start to examine all of the ways in which it's already regulated, um, if not by labor law, then by criminal law or property law, for example, 
and to recognize that given its uh, very diverse forms, its heterogeneity, that uh, there's going to be no single answer to the problems of informal workers, um, and it will certainly um, uh, they will certainly extend well beyond uh, labor law proper. The other example, of course, would be uh, uh, to, to reverse the normal thinking around unpaid work. Um, and here I'll just note briefly that labor law and, in fact, uh, uh, um, most policy and institutional analyses of work simply exclude unpaid work. Their primary concern is market work. And in all discussions of the future of work, unpaid work enters in primarily uh, uh, because it's a source of labor market disadvantage, for example, for women, or uh, a site of discrimination for racialized workers. Um, the idea here would be uh, to imagine um, uh, the normative worker, the average worker, the normal worker, as a worker that is not only a market worker, but a worker that is constantly carrying and managing a series of tasks in both the realms of production and reproduction, um, why might we do that? Well, because we actually want to trace the flow of resources and leisure and cross subsidies across these divides. Um, uh, um, and in general, we want to critically engage uh, future of work images and discussions that imagine that welfare gains for workers and indeed for society at, uh, as a whole um, uh, uh, are, are achieved through the progressive integration of people into unwaged work. Um, um, the idea is that there are dystopian as well as utopian futures for workers along this path. We need to seize the boat out. And finally, um, uh, we might decenter the nation um, in work and its regulation in recognition of the denationalization of production itself. And this will, of course, give us a basis on which to uh, look anew at problems of migration, to think about why migration is simultaneously such uh, uh, um, uh, a degraded form of work in most contexts, but also deeply normal and deeply integrated into the regular world of work. So let me just stop now and um, uh, um, hand it back over to David. Great, thanks. I really appreciate it, Carrie. So now each one of our panelists has undertaken a study in a particular area that tries to go deep into the questions of structural inequality <clears throat> and figure out what it would mean to think differently about them. And I thought what it might make sense to do is simply ask each of our panelists in alphabetical order to give us a brief sense, um, maybe followed by some reactions from our other panelists, of, of where they looked and, and what they found and how, how they might encourage us to rethink these basic, uh, basic questions. With any luck, uh, we'll be able to bring a bunch of these different projects together in a kind of general book on the subject, argument about how one might engage structural inequality. Who knows? We'll see. But let's see. Let's start with, with Helena Alviar, who did a project with Professor Jorge Gonzalez from the University of Los Angeles, which, of Los Andes in, in Bogota, Colombia, who's not able to be with us today. Um, but Helena, what, what did you all find? Thank you. So thank you, Karen Neville and Sarah for organizing this and to all the members of this group. Um, since April 28th of this year, Colombia has been facing a series of civil uprisings triggered by a tax reform proposed by the right-wing government of Iván Duque. The reform was necessary, according to the government, to pay for the social program set in place during the pandemic. It was structured around expanding the number of people paying in income tax, starting with those earning more than US $500, and increasing or, for the first time, including a value-added tax over most basic goods. One of the points that stung the most is that the year of a pandemic, it also increased the tax over funerary services. The reform, of course, was the tip of an iceberg of unrest. In a country that was already the second most unequal one in the region and the seventh most unequal in the world, this proposal, which would punish the poorest segments of the population who had already been heavily hit by the effects of COVID-19, was not taken lightly. 
millions of people have and continue to march the streets. When young people were asked if they didn't fear getting killed by either the police, the army, who, who violently reacted to the protest or exposed to COVID, many answered, we are already dying of hunger or risking ourselves with precarious jobs. It is much better to die fighting for what is fair. The specific debate around the reform has been centered around the cruelty of, that an increase in the evaluated tax would entail. Without wanting to deny this, there is an important debate to be had about what it left untouched. The amount of exemptions that certain sectors enjoy, including palm oil producers, which is where we concentrate our chapter, and the fact that the tax over rural property in Colombia is very low as the value of land has remained underpriced in most regions of the country. Our chapter, which analyzes palm oil production, aims to foreground some of the issues regarding inequality that are much less discussed. Palm oil is a key product in the Colombian economy and has brought about social, economic, ecological, and political transformations in several regions. In the text, we oppose a neoliberal account which describes free trade and Colombia's privileged geography as a source of a comparative advantage which make it a perfect good for the country to export. We also distance ourselves from left critiques that describe conflicts surrounding palm production as an issue simply of labor and human rights violations. Instead, we unveil how the narrative of market centrality, free trade, and the strengthening of a product because of its comparative advantage is really an account of how the palm oil industry deployed mainstream economic and legal discourse to capture rents. In addition, using distributional analysis, we foreground the role that property, how its value is structured around real, real, low real estate taxes, and public subsidies granted to landlords and its interaction to labor. So when workers are scarce, they are offered to become owners and join pro production cooperatives. This way shifting many costs to them and also subdividing workers by making some of them property owners. This frames the allocation of resource and power beyond the violation of labor or human rights or the centrality of the civil Colombian civil conflict. We end the chapter with a description of palm oil production in the region of Chocó, which covers 46, around 46,000 square kilometers and where close to 80% of its population is Afro-Colombian. We hone into this region because it brings to light insights that dependency theory and racial capitalism have had, including the deployment of racialized bodies to extract resources in the reach. And I would leave it at that. I can, of course, discuss many of the issues that I talked about here. Thank you very much. Elena, thank you so much. That's really terrific and gives us a real introduction to how we need to start thinking differently. Before we move on, I don't think Gender has been able to join us yet, but before we move on to Karen and Sam's paper, are there other folks from the panel who'd like to make a comment or ask a question to Helena? We just have a few minutes before we move on. Maybe I can just say a word here um, and pick up something Helena mentioned uh, at the very end, which is the pronounced concentration of Afro-descendant workers in the plantations. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the deep puzzles um, uh, for all of us is coming to grips with uh, persistent racial fissuring and fragmentation at work. Um, uh, it's uh, the concentration of racialized workers in particular uh, forms of work and under poor terms and conditions of work is, is a common phenomenon. We see it in virtually every labor market of the world. And this is one of the things that traditional labor law um, has immense difficulty actually um, uh, recognizing and coming to grips with and I just want to highlight it as one of the central impulses for rethinking the law of work and for trying to put uh, questions of work into conversation. 
with histories of racial capitalism. There's a kind of present value and Helena's case, Helena and Jorge's case study, I think um, is a beautiful illustration of, of uh, why we actually might need to engage in these inquiries. But I, think I would add, no, go ahead. can I say something quickly? Um, sure. Because I would add that the other interesting aspect about it is also the shift of making workers property owners. So actually in, it, it's, it's not, it doesn't even improve their situation. It actually sometimes worsens it, but there is in this shift of identity, there is also the idea of subdividing even more workers. So, you know, any antagonizing them. So that would be an additional comment I would make regarding that. I mean, one of the things that I think we, we struggled through in every one of the conversations we've had is how many social justice oriented areas of the law certainly don't put racialization at the center. It's a different kind of topic and what it would mean to do that um, when it's so much a central part of the organization of something like work is a kind of puzzle that we've been that we've been chewing on that a lot of work is out there doing that. Um, and it's a, a kind of a challenge to all of us to try to figure out how to make that more a normal part of where we begin to think about the structure of these social forms. Okay, well, let's move along. Um, so Karen and Sam, you guys have done a study in Austin, Texas. Um, it has about, uh, it has work and tech and racialization, all kinds of things in the middle of it. Um, do you wanna tell us a little bit about that? Sure, I'll start. And actually I'll just add one additional comment to Elena and Jorge's um, chapter, which is that it's not just about who the workers are, but it's also about dispossession of land, um, largely of the, on which Afro-descendant communities have lived um, to be used for the production of the palm oil and um, I, or, or for the plantations. And that's that form of dispossession actually will tie in quite well, I think, and, um, to what, some of what we're going to talk about. Um, and so seeing those transnational connections are also um, sometimes comparisons and sometimes connections are also really important. Um, so Sam Tabry and I, uh, and I'll just kick us off and then he'll, he'll fill in most of the, the meat. Sam, Sam and I are using the situation of low wage, largely undocumented Latinx construction workers um, who were deemed essential by the state of Texas during the COVID-19 pandemic to consider the distributive and racialized effects of a specific brand of growth politics found in, and in case anybody's not looking, I'm putting in square quotes, the progressive boomtown of Austin, Texas. Um, so we hope to use this study to begin to imagine what alternative possibilities might exist for the future of work and livelihood in an urban regional political economy that is not centered around growth and that embodies a radically different configuration of value. And the title of our chapter is uh, Beyond Essential, a Pandemic, Growth, and the Future of Expendable Work in a Progressive Boomtown. So we consider the situation of these workers with respect to two related moments during the pandemic. In the first one early on, the state of Texas declared all construction work essential. And in doing so reversed a decision by Austin to limit most construction work during the pandemic. And it's predicted that the decision led to construction workers being five times more likely than other workers to be hospitalized for COVID-19. In the second moment, only a few months later in the summer, still during the pandemic, Local officials chose to provide millions of dollars of tax incentives to attract a major corporate manufacturing project. Um, and that was of Tesla to the region. And they did so even as local funds for pandemic emergency response efforts that were aimed at low income undocumented workers, um, including construction workers who had been excluded from state and federal support were proving to be inadequate. So we contend that growth politics are at the center of both of these stories. Now, when construction workers started showing up in hospitals with severe COVID-19 and disproportionate numbers, and I'll say we know that because of Dr. Snehal Patel, who I see is in the audience too. 
Um, health and safety guidelines were not the only needed site of policy intervention. Um, we need to understand the distributive consequences of a whole variety of legal rules and policy regimes in order to see how they produced the structural precarity for low income construction workers that the pandemic was just an add on to. So that is, as David and Carrie suggested, we need to go deeper and beyond labor law or, or health and safety regulations. So with that, I turn to Sam. Great, thanks, Karen. Um, and so picking up off of where Karen left off, so to do so, to go deeper, we considered two broad frames of, of rules that we found had been largely backgrounded in sort of the diagnosis uh, of this larger situation. And so one frame considers the rules that go into the, the making so-called of the essential but expendable worker. Um, and there we look at immigration law and policy, preemption dynamics wherein the state precludes local authorities from enacting more progressive policy agendas um, across questions of living wages, sick leave, sanctuary city policies, affordable housing tools, um, and also dynamics of both past and present racialized displacement pressure dating back to the city of Austin's 1927 plan and its urban segregation policies. Um, so the second frame considers the particular style of growth politics that characterized the larger Austin region. And so Austin's trajectory is very much premised on its ability to simultaneously maintain a progressive, again, in square, square scare quotes, image for the region, um, and maintain a low cost of living relative to averages in national so-called peer cities, um, a posture that is in part made possible by the preemption dynamics we were just discussing that foster a pro-business, pro-development climate across the state as a whole. Um, and so what we are trying to ask is basically who is paying the costs associated with making any so-called regional low cost of living possible? Some of those costs are no doubt borne by low-income workers, including construction workers. Um, at the same time, a number of subsidy mechanisms ensure that large corporate actors actively benefit from, but are only minimally saddled with, responsibility for supporting broader conditions of urban regional social reproduction. Um, low tax burdens, incentives for corporate investment and relocation, as well as sustained public investment that undergird the region's high-skilled, high-technology economy, um, which often goes unacknowledged by the corporate actors who benefit from those public subsidies. The, the saga of Tesla's recruitment and ultimate decision to locate a billion-dollar vehicle manufacturing plant in the Austin region, which again played out sort of in, at the height of the pandemic, captures incredibly well virtually all of these growth dynamics, with Elon Musk making it fairly clear that he wants to avoid a particular public taxation and regulatory burden he currently encounters in California. And, and not to put too fine a point on the growth connection, Musk has used social media to urgently call for new housing to be constructed in the region um, that for his workers in which they'll live, as well as to make nationwide pleas for workers to move to Austin to work for Tesla and SpaceX. So while local government agreements with Tesla include minimum wage requirements for those workers directly employed or contracted by Tesla at their plant, what protections exist for the workers who will build the apartments and houses that a corporation's employees will live in, or for the low wage service workers that will provide labor more generally in the larger urban regional economy in which a corporation's employees will be enjoying that so-called lower regional cost of living. And coming back to our interest in taking seriously the possibility of diminished growth imperatives, as well as the future of work and livelihood, we get to questions about what workers themselves actually think about such challenges and the alternative visions on which they might be based. So our discussions with low-income Latinx construction workers about their perceptions of growth in the economy in Austin and about whether they see themselves as having benefited from the region's growth reveal a complicated picture regarding assessments of economic security and prosperity. Some responses were frankly unequivocally positive, um, but, but our questions only probe the current landscape. It remains to be seen whether workers in Austin's construction industry or any other industry for that matter, can imagine an understanding of prosperity, of security, of well-being without growth. So to put it differently, we're ultimately left with the question, is growth essential? Um, so I'll stop there and, and thanks for having listened to our work, but um, looking forward to the discussion. Terrific. That's really wonderful. Are there thoughts now to share with with uh, with Sam and Karen before we move along? 
If not, let's see if we can bring Jennifer Gordon into the story, who's looked also in great detail at um, what happens when you have a group of workers who are left out and you try to bring them in. When does that go well? When does it not go well? Um, what happens? Jennifer, what did you look at and what did you find? So my chapter is uh, about or really begins in 2014 with the arrival of hundreds of thousands and then eventually millions uh, of Syrian refugees in the EU. And that is not generally discussed as a story about work or, or the future of work, but I want to talk about it that way. And, and that is because as the EU entered a sort of crisis battle about whether this was a humanitarian situation or a, a sovereign threat, uh, the way it decided it could uh, escape from that tension was through a plan that first was proposed by two Oxford professors uh, in 2015 as the crisis heightened. Uh, where the idea was that the EU should essentially pay refugee host countries near Syria to offer work to Syrians and quite explicitly so that the Syrians would not come to the European Union uh, and that they should do this through trade preferences by encouraging export led, <coughs> excuse me, export led development and the employment of Syrians in special manufacturing zones. And this idea caught fire, <coughs> excuse me, very quickly. So by early 2016, the European Union, the World Bank and Jordan had signed something called the Jordan Compact. And in the Jordan Compact, the European Union and the World Bank had agreed to give billions, $2 billion uh, in aid and loans and trade preferences to the government of Jordan. And Jordan had agreed to create jobs for 200,000 Syrians, give them work permits, and three quarters of them were supposed to work in garment factories in export processing zones uh, in jobs that then were occupied largely by South Asian migrant women. Uh, and the remaining quarter were to work largely in construction and agriculture in jobs then occupied by Egyptian migrant men. Um, and I would just note the, this classic core periphery move, right, in the neoliberal tradition that development uh, will, the, you know, good will come for everybody through work that is created by export. Um, so really my chapter is about what happened next. What happened when this plan created in the EU and the halls of the World Bank hit the ground in Jordan? Uh, and the short answer there is it was a total failure. Today, uh, maybe 300, maybe 400 Syrian refugees work in Jordanian garment factories uh, compared to 150,000, the number that was supposed to be working by now uh, there. Uh, another 45,000 do hold work permits, but they work in largely informal jobs, uh, again, in construction and agriculture, not in these formal, uh, and to echo what Kerry said earlier, supposedly better jobs in garment, uh, which were explicitly rejected by the Syrian refugees even as the garment employers in those zones rejected Syrians as employees. So uh, this worked for nobody. Um, and the chapter focuses on the tensions between the assumptions of the planners of this idea uh, and the assumptions of actors on the ground. And so with regard to the planners, uh, I focus on the idea embedded in this context, uh, the compact about the racial and gender substitutability and suitability of certain kinds of workers for certain kinds of work, drawing on the analytical tools of racial capitalism and also the assumptions about the economic structure of the garment industry uh, as it was embedded in Jordan, and therefore the assumption in the pact that it would spur changes in behavior on the, pack, on the part of Jordanian garment employers to have the carrot of EU trade preferences dangled 
before them. Um, and those assumptions, as it happened, did not reflect and indeed were in conflict with the actual dynamics on the ground in Jordan. Um, and so because of the economic structure of garment production in Jordan, the employers have no interest in the supposed substitutability of their migrant workforce for a refugee workforce. Likewise, Syrian refugees had no interest in taking up garment work, which didn't pay enough to allow them to survive in Jordan where they were living. Um, and the, the tension created what anthropologist Michelle Rolfe Triot refers to as motion in the system, right? Enough play between what the planners anticipated and what the reality was on the ground so that various actors in the so-called periphery uh, in the world systems view here, including not only garment employers and Syrian refugees, but also the Egyptian government, uh, which strongly opposed this idea that its workers would be pushed out in favor of Syrian refugees, uh, created enough room for them to effectively resist the plan that was being imposed on them by the core. And I'll stop there. Great, thanks so much. So we have a bunch of different papers all on the table already before we move on to, um, uh, to, to Vanya and Neville. Um, are there questions that one raised about another that would be useful to think about? So if, I mean, it just occurs to me just hearing these in sequence that in Karen and Sam's paper, um, there are all these essential workers who are brought in and do all this essential work. And in Jennifer's paper, there are all these surplus people who are finding a hard time finding a place where they can become essential workers doing some kind of thing. Um, I, I guess, you know, at a very simple level, it tells me it's complicated what goes on. So the ways in which people are disprivileged by the structure of work is an incredibly diverse one and in which you might think having access to a kind of formal work is the right way to go, it turns out not only to be not possible, but not always so promising to get back to one of Carrie's original flips. But other thoughts or cross conversations? Okay, so let's move along. So, uh, you know, if we're thinking about the future of work, we also have to think about the past of work and the present of work and how we think about the relationship between what we know now and how we understand conditions and structures and so forth to repeat themselves and, and what's our ability actually to look around the corner and see what's coming. Um, and I know that both, both Vanya and Neville have thought a great deal about that in very different ways. Um, Vanya, what have you been looking at and what can you report to us? Thank you, David. Uh, let me see if I can, oh, I'm unmuted, okay, fine. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Carrie, as well, for such a thoughtful introduction. And thank you, Sarah, for organizing everything. And, you know, panel, co panelists, I look forward to discussing these things with you. And thank you so much, Karen and Neville, uh, for inviting me to be, you know, part of your book and of a series of most enjoyable and intellectually generative meetings on work and temporality, as I would frame it, uh, including this panel here. And good afternoon to everyone, or good evening, rather, to all from London. So my chapter, which is titled Triple Dispossession and Stories of Distemporalization in New Orleans, uh, engages the temporality of work in its violent uh, dispossessive modes, which uh, figure as an abiding feature of racial capitalism. On the one hand, uh, enforcing the gender binary became part and parcel of European and slavery's experimentations in an increasingly globalized racial capitalist land-based and oceanic networks of trade in enslaved humans, whether African or indigenous to the Americas. Uh, for example, a European entrepot in West Africa would already serve as a space of heightened and forceful gendering and racialization of enslaved Africans in accordance with the more and more standardized forms of uh, commercial categorization and value, even before they were sent onto the perilous voyage through the Middle Passage. But on the other hand, such forms of violence could never fully succeed in the unmaking of an astonishingly complex and diverse forms of 
West African gender non-binary existence. What's more, enslaved Africans forcefully misgendered, though they may have been, encountered and formed alliances with indigenous and even some European lower class communities and labor force, but some of which were in their own ways resistant to the colonial gender binary and the class and racial divisions fundamental to early forms of racial capitalism. So focusing on 18th and 19th century New Orleans, I argued that gender non-conforming individuals and communities of color were at least triply dispossessed, not only due to their perceived race and class or status, but also due to their gender difference, uh, bringing forth a range of resistive remnants of circumatlantic black and indigenous gender non-conformity. My chapter centers on three distinct sociotemporal contexts of 18th century, antebellum and fin de siècle New Orleans, which reveal a changing landscape of racial capitalist regulation of the gender binary and the sites of labor. Uh, with respect to the 18th century colonial New Orleans, uh, my work has revealed a series of indicative fragments, uh, stories of open rebellion aboard the slavers' ships, sailing towards Louisiana, seemingly led by some key gender transgressive subjectivities in Senegambia, or the memoirs, such as one published in 1753 by a colonial officer and farmer describing sexual and gender nonconformity among the Natchez, who was revolved uh, in 1729, likely supported by other oppressed populations of Louisiana, nearly put an end to the colony. While these scattered archival traces might not directly point out to any particular form of labor, they do relate to the fact that out of some 3,909 enslaved people brought from Senegambian ports into Louisiana between 1719 and 1731, one fifth were not or could not be gendered in the surviving colonial records, so that it took the corrective pen uh, of a late 20th century team of historians and archivists to give them their would-be gender binary designation. For the antebellum example, I focus on abolitionists' first-hand account of New Orleanian trade in enslaved human beings and its relationship with the practice of organized sex work in the city, which poses a series of difficult questions around both resistance and compliance to the new United States and formations of an ever transforming gender and racial capitalist regime on the ground. And finally, uh, my third fund the cycle example uh, centers on a racialized gender nonconformity in Storywell, New Orleans is uh, legal red light district that operated between 1898 and 1917. And there, the sites of legalized sex work stood in stark contrast with the still unregulated so-called crips, a contrast entirely produced and policed by the perceived gender and color line. So in short, New Orleans, this uneasy city, which had been from its very founding designated as the devil's own domain for its ostensible sexual, gender, class, and racial transgressions, offers a unique insight into the centrality of moral and economic alienation of certain forms of bodily labor, such as sex work, for the enduring projects of racial capitalism. So my chapter then asks, what practices of temporal alienation or distemporalization such forms of labor would have to contend with? And just how in turn gender non-conforming subjectivities, whether enslaved or free among New Orleanian communities of color organized and sustain their resistance to this systemic violence. And this is you know, not only to query how counter histories are invoked and worked out to interrupt and challenge the dominant knowledge making patterns in the three exemplary periods of colonial antebellum and fin de siècle New Orleans, but also to unsettle uh, what still appears to be an abiding linear futurity of work and human subjectivity making likewise. Thank you. Great, really interesting. Um, and quite a historical deep dive uh, in order to figure all that out. So thank you for doing it and thank you for sharing it with us. Um, Neville, you've also been doing some interdisciplinary thinking about this. Um, another deep dive, this time into the literary as well as the historical. What have you found? Thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you, David. Um, Okay, the title of my piece is deceptively simple. It's just called The Past of the Future of Work. Um, though like Vanya, I share a resistance to uh, certain forms of linear temporality. Um, 
So in short, I look at three Victorian texts that are profoundly concerned with the topic of the future of work. Uh, many Victorians were also super anxious uh, about the future of work. We're looking at the rise of electricity, the beginning of, of Ford's production, um, massive problems and opportunities in colonial labor exploitation. Um, so a set of historical circumstances that generated uh, an interest in and concern with uh, the future of work as people knew it. Um, so, and I actually think in a way though, I'll, at the end of my paper, I hope to get to how do we unsettle the obviousness of the question of the future of work and what are our modes analytic and affective for broaching the question of futurity. Okay, but first my primary texts. Okay, I look at H.G. Wells's 1895, The Time Machine, which I assume most people are familiar with, maybe through its various filmic incarnations. In that novel, Wells has this dystopian fantasy that the British class division, and let's say between capitalist bourgeois on one side and working class people, has hardened into a race or even species division. So in the, our time traveler discovers two kinds of humans in the world of the future, the Morlocks and the Eloys. Uh, and the Morlocks are descendants from the working class and the Eloys are descendants um, of the middle and upper classes. And power has been reversed. It's literally an eat the rich narrative. So actually the Morlocks now just eat Eloys and the Morlocks have acquired this uh, superiority through continued contact with machinery. Uh, what's also, so, so we've got a totally different future of work. And um, what's secondarily interesting to me is that both these societies seem not to have gender differentiation. When he first meets both new species, he can't tell man from woman. He has a moment of homosexual panic when the Morlocks grope him because he doesn't yet know they're seeing him as food. They think he thinks he might be groped for other purposes. Um, we only get one individuated character who is feminized, but it takes quite a long time for her gender to be re revealed, which is the Eloy Wiener who he saves from the Morlocks. Um, so I kind of think what that tells me is Wells, at least, even in a dystopian register, kind of understood that you couldn't have reconfigured labor, both productive and reproductive labor imaginaries, without transforming race relations and gender relations. Um, and, and, and he's terrified by that. Okay, then the second novel I look at is Edward Bulwer-Lytton's Edward, Edward Bulwer 1870, The Coming Race. Uh, I mean, Bulwer Lytton has fallen into obscurity, but he was Charles Dickens's best friend and a member of parliament and wrote a series of terrible, terrible novels. Um, the Coming Race is really interesting. It's about a race of people who live underground in the United States. Um, and they have discovered this magical substance called Vril. And I think Vril is the deep antecedent of vibranium in Black Panther. I, mean, I think many of these tropes have a long popular cultural life. And Vril is basically just magic. You don't have to work at all. You put your finger out, you zap Vril, it'll make a house, it'll grow a crop, it'll do everything. Um, in a certain way, Vril anticipates electricity. And I think it anticipates the kind of magical transformations uh, that a boosterous version of techno utopia also deploys. Now, what's interesting about the the Vrilia, who are the people who have Vril underground, is that they are terrible, terrible imperialists. They, so they have established dominion over the whole world of underground by killing every other inhabitant. Um, the children are all soldiers because children make good soldiers because they're naturally much more vicious. Um, and sexual relations are reversed. Um, so women have agency in courtship which terrifies our protagonist. And except for the supreme leader who's still male, every other authority figure in the underground world is female. Um, I think this is more a fantasy of the phallic mother than feminism, but that's another point. 
Okay, and then while soul of socialism of man under socialism, socialism just thinks in the future, the state will make what's useful and the rest of us need to just become artists and do what we want. So I'm interested in the content of these imaginings because I think they still play out in, in the various imaginaries of the future of work we have today on all sides of the political spectrum. And then I'm also interested in what I'm calling the mode of futurity. So do we think about futurity as a kind of repetition compulsion? Do we think about futurity as aspiration? Uh, do we think about futurity as prognosis? That actually there are different modes for, for imagining this thing that actually we can't really know. Um, and I think there's lots of interesting queer theoretical thinking that can help us get to the mode in which we want to broach futurity. And I know I'm out of time, so I'll do it in, in very irresponsible shorthand. I would say on the one poll, you've got Lee Edelman's No Future, Queer, uh, queer Theory and the Death Drive, which is the repetition compulsion mode. And on the other end of the spectrum, you'd have texts like um, Jose Munoz's Cruising Utopia and, okay, let's say Jill Dolan's Finding Hope at the Theater and Lauren Berlant's Cruel Optimism kind of mediates those. I also think there's a relationship with Afrofuturism, which gives us a different mode for thinking about how we might want to put the concept of the future under the same kind of pressure that we've been putting the concept of work under. Okay, thank you. Great, Neville, thanks so much. Um, so there's an incredible amount on the table at the moment. We've got about another half hour for a conversation. Um, I know I've learned a lot already. Maybe, I mean, let me just tell you some takeaways for me that may suggest places in which people might want to intervene. And if you're thinking of intervening, we're a small enough group, you can you can try raising your hand um, in the Zoom mode we've all become accustomed to, or, or just put a question uh, in the chat addressed to me. Um, but what, I mean, some takeaways. I guess first, my first takeaway that I got out of the discussion today is lots of the ways we think about labor and its future need some updating. Um, although maybe after having listened to Neville, updating isn't really, we shouldn't be thinking updating is the way to, to do things. But anyway, I mean, so first of all, labor law might not be the right legal fulcrum for empowering those who work. Um, we might have to flip our sense of formal work as the rule and informal as the exception or paid work as the norm and unpaid as the exception. And then I guess putting racialization at the center of discussions of labor and work takes work. Uh, it turns out it doesn't come automatically to the progressive discourses that have traditionally championed the worker. Um, but needs to be brought to bear as a central focal point. So that would be, I guess, my first set of takeaways. Folks may want to chime in on that series of, of themes that we've had. So my second would be identifying the structures of inequality just turns out to be really hard. Um, but it's not the structure of capitalism or the structure of the world system in general. It takes a careful look at the details of institutional and legal arrangements and you find really surprising things. So as we learned from the palm oil case, giving workers property turns out not to really be always the best way to help them out um, or to have all kinds of other um, consequences. Um, that there's a need to look behind the legal frame of human rights violators and victims and get into property and tax and all kinds of other things. Um, or at the really deep range of legal rules that constitute the high tech magic of a place like Austin, um, concentrating gains on the Teslas and costs on all kinds of other people as we saw in Sam and Kerry's paper. So structure turns out to be not something you can say right off what it is, but it takes a lot of very specific investigation. It's going to turn out to be a very differentiated structure in lots of different places, as well as a global one. Uh, and I guess the third takeaway theme we might talk about is the world. So um, there's a there's a kind of custom of thinking about the future of work in terms of what's going to happen to workers in our country, whatever country that turns out to be. Um, including those that we've valorized as the kind of workers that we mostly have and that those we've rendered invisible as the kind that we don't really have. Um, but inequalities do compound globally and it's hard to think about the future of work without thinking about migration 
and the global distribution of types of work um, or the ways global value chains are structured um, not just between Silicon Valley and Austin, Texas, and but over the whole planet to concentrate gains, innovations, and financial rents in the global north um, and distributing and remaking the conditions of work along the way. So a theme about those global issues that we might want to touch on a little bit. Um, and then I guess uh, perhaps most significantly, the notion that conventional waged work hardly begins to capture what people do to survive uh, in this planet, that even in high tech hubs like Austin, the formal economy rests on a, the labor of stigmatized, racialized, undocumented labor of all kinds. Um, and then there are um, what Jennifer called surplus people, people who don't and can't work, whether formally or informally, and turning them into formal workers, as we learned from Jordan's experience, turns out to be more complex and less promising than we might have imagined in the first go round. Well, so far, that all sounds really like a kind of a downer. Um, but then there also turn out to be some, some possibilities. And I'm sorry, Jen Baer hasn't been able to be with us, but she has a marvelous study of the ways in which um, dairy workers, undocumented dairy workers, starting in Vermont's dairy industry, um, have modeled the possibility of social mobilizations under these conditions, a kind of crack and opening of possibilities, but also um, cracks that open for reimagination. And I guess that might be the most crucial takeaway um, that Neville and Vanya both challenged us in different ways to reframe the discussion altogether. Um, and to reimagine not only what we think of as work or where labor law fits in and so forth, but how we imagine racial, gender, and historical systems within which we think work takes place and where we look to understand work um, in the literary, as opposed to in the case study of the workers that we read about in a particular place. And in the forgotten past, in Vanya's study of the survival of indigenous and circumatlantic black gender nonconformity and new settings of subordinated work. So there's a lot of, of ways that, that you all have explored asking harder questions about work and about the structures of inequality. And um, it's, it is a difficult project to try to bring them all together, but I'd really be interested in some thoughts and reactions, maybe first from among the panelists, but also if anybody who's been listening in has something they'd like to contribute um, at this point, we have almost a half an hour left for some open discussion. Uh, maybe what I thought I'd do to get it started is just go back through the panel and try to ask each of you, and I should have said this at the beginning so you could be thinking about it, um, what struck you in the other presentations that you've heard? Um, as a particular telling thing. So not in your own paper, and not asking you to elaborate on it further, but asking you to, to think what, what did somebody else say that you heard that might lead you to think about your own issues in a, in a way that you might not have already. Um, and why don't we just go in the order that we did before, if that's all right. If I could start, Carrie, with you, what did you, what things did you hear in some of these other papers that are worth, that for you were striking or surprising? Yeah, uh, in unbelievably rich um, uh, presentations. Um, one was the salience of dispossession uh, to questions of work. Um, it popped up across a number of, of papers and it reminded me of the very long history of land dispossession in the construction and emergence and catalyzing of, of wage labor. So that popped out. Um, uh, maybe another thing was, um, and it, perhaps this is an example of, of repetition compulsion that Neville was, was um, speculating on, but uh, the paradoxes uh, of, um, of elite action. I, I, I was thinking in, in Jennifer's uh, discussion to the fact that um, uh, macroeconomic policy, uh, which is designed to produce these formalized productive workers, you know, paradoxically 
produces an army of informal workers, right? So it's it's just working at cross purposes. Um, and, and this paper too was just a brilliant illustration, I think of the fact that um, laws and policies that are at, at first glance at just immense distance from, from work, like, you know, a geopolitical conflict um, actually turn out to be the most important things for the workers in Washington. So um, thanks, Carrie. So I'm going to I'm going to move along and ask Helena now. But first, I want to say that Jen Bear has been able to join us. I think so. Jen, are you here somewhere? Yes, I yes, see I you. Yes, I am. I'm right. sorry. So um, so what we've done so far is just each each person has said a little bit about the study that they have undertaken and um, and what they found that might be illuminating for us in thinking about structures of inequality on the one hand in some way and the the nature of work and its role in another. And I'm going to come back to you to see whether you'd be willing to do the same thing um, in, in just a moment. But then I'm going, we're just going around the panel and saying, what did everybody hear in everybody else's paper that was interesting? And Helene, I just wonder what you, before I get to Jen and give her a chance to let her catch her breath, having just arrived, um, what did you hear in other um, papers that struck you? So for Carrie, it was this dispossession issue, which I think I mean, even when we think of plantation labor in the United States, we tend not to think that all of that was the result of the dispossession of other people who were working on that land and living on it before, who had to be moved or killed. Um, so the dispossession element of even the most subordinated labor is an interesting part of the story that we need to attend to. Helena, what did you hear that struck you? Yeah, two things. I mean, it was really interesting and very rich, but the first one is, something that I have been thinking about uh, since the initial stages of the project and that um, was very relevant today, which is the role of work in everybody's lives. So very prevalent in Vanya and Neville's presentation, eh, but also in Jennifer and in a way um, the palm oil <coughs> case has to do with that. So that was one point. And the other one is the, analysis of or how globalization is related to most of what we talked about so or is crystallized in most of the projects that we talked about those would be my two the two things that I was thinking about terrific really really interesting so let let me break in now and see if Jen if you give us a sense of what you found I, I've sort of foreshadowed you a little bit by saying you're the one optimistic person who found a crack in the overall space where people were trying to do something to produce new kinds of social mobilization um, mm -hmm. while also drawing attention to the the incredible way in which global value chains have reorganized and repositioned work in all kinds of different ways um, but give us a sense of what you studied and what you found well the, the pressure of uh, being an optimist is weighing heavily on me but um <laughs> no i the particular um kind of movement that I'm looking at is called Migrant Justice, and it's based in um, in Vermont. And it, it started essentially um, as a community organizing effort in the wake of the death of a young um, migrant farm worker from Chiapas, Mexico. And that organizing um, basically eventually came to center on a really innovative strategy that tried to use the structure essentially of the milk value chain to create um, a certain degree of protection for migrant workers that are laboring on uh, Vermont dairy farms. And they face a number of challenges. One is just sort of the, the social isolation. Um, the farms are you know, in rural areas. And unlike in migrant labor in something like row crops in Florida, um, where the fair food program, which is the model basically that this group in Vermont was looking to, where there's you know, hundreds of workers um, uh, on a crew potentially, there is usually only a small handful of workers uh, living on these dairy farms as well as working on them. Um, they also face a situation of um, increased and you know, really escalated immigration enforcement. And that's particularly acute in the Vermont context because it's not only you know, ICE, it's also border patrol in, in much of the state um, that is operating. And then they face you know, just kind of punishing working conditions and really excessive and irregular hours. So, you know, there are lots of laws on the books that might theoretically um, be mobilized to address these problems, um, but they're just not uh, enforced. And so what this migrant um, 
worker organization did uh, eventually was seize on a strategy of a kind of public campaign targeting Ben and Jerry's, which is a very visible, you know, kind of progressively branded Vermont company that is a major client of dairy farms um, in the area where they were organizing. And they basically got a negotiated agreement with um, Ben and Jerry's that essentially uh, compels Ben and Jerry's to compel the dairy farms are supplying them to put in place a pretty rigorous set um, of worker protections and to enforce it in a meaningful way through um, independent um, labor monitoring. What I do in the chapter is try to think about um, this case through the three kinds of analytical lenses that we're bringing in the volume. Um, I don't know the degree to which you've talked about them already, so I apologize for missing the earlier conversation. But you know, I'm looking at racial capitalism to try to understand, um, you know, both the, the kind of the devaluation of this migrant labor, both because of the um, legal vulnerabilities that these workers face, but also I'm I'm trying to understand how there's a kind of discursive construction um, of a kind of racialized migrant labor that is operating here as well. Um, world systems theory is useful, of course, for thinking just about the underlying structural inequalities that are generating the migratory flows that are bringing um, these workers to Vermont dairy farms. But it's also helpful for thinking about this kind of the political economy of the international dairy trade, which is really important for understanding the, the fortunes of these fair dairy farms in Vermont. But really, I think that the chapter is mostly trying to apply distributional analysis to think about how this very particular um, worker-centered supply chain strategy is attempting to intervene in the dairy supply chain and sort of shift the surplus, right, sort of, you know, from Ben and Jerry's towards both the dairy farms, interestingly, um, and the workers that are employing them, employing them. But I'm also, you know, trying to think through what some of the, and this is the less optimistic part, what some of the limitations um, of that strategy are and, and the difficulty um, really of, in some sense, kind of generalizing this model in a way that would expand um, the protections that it provides um, to the workers on the farms that uh, that it covers. Great, thanks, Jen. Um, well, so that's very optimistic, um, <laughs> or at least it's, uh, there are people doing something and yeah. acting in a way that that um, that both helps us to understand what the structure is against which they need to pitch themselves, and also how there are cracks here and there that might be might be made useful. Um, let me just remind folks who are listening in, if you've got something you want to add, feel free to raise your hand or put something in note in the chat to me. Um, but Sam, what did you think? Did you, when you were listening to the, the papers, what were there themes or particular things that jumped out to you and said, well, that, that is a common piece among these different stories? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so actually, sort of hearing Neville's piece last, I think was really helpful in the sense also the framing of like what the authors themselves were particularly terrified about in the tales that they were telling about the future made me think about sort of this recurring question of anxiety that I think is percolating up in, in different people's accounts, but it's really differentiated. So it's a question of sort of like who is anxious about what, but also who isn't anxious about what. Um, and so that's both thinking about sort of in Jennifer's piece or Jennifer Gordon's piece, the, the, the anxieties of the EU or the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund, thinking about the work that will be done by surplus populations, so-called surplus populations. But you could also think about that in the Austin case, this question of workers being anxious about what? Are they actually anxious about growth? In some ways, it doesn't really appear that they are. But there's also another element there where it's like, the urban regional economy as a whole, the powers that be aren't particularly anxious about the work that these sort of essential but expendable workers are doing precisely because they are, have been rendered expendable because somebody can, th their work can be replaced. So just thinking about that analytic of anxiety as a way to think about who's anxious about what really changes the nature of the stories we might be telling across some of these. Um, and assume, it seems as if there'd be a bunch of anxieties embedded in each of the stories and maybe parsing them gets us a little bit closer to understanding even more towards like strategic interventions of, of how do you think about both present conditions at the same time as thinking about future conditions and, and who has to face challenges or trade-offs sort of in different temporal scales of thinking. But that, that's just what was coming to mind from the conversation as a whole.
Yeah, really interesting. I mean, one of the things that I think has struck me throughout a lot of these conversations is that we tend to focus on material things when we think about labor and its future and the global organization of things, but the global distribution of honor and shame of security and anxiety and so forth and who has it. And it's not always the dispossessed that have the most anxiety. Uh, and so the, the, the questions of who's anxious about what and how that shapes what it is that happens um, is something that, it, it, like other aspects that are not foregrounded in our conventional stories, it, it's very difficult to put front and center in understanding what's going on with something like the structure of inequality and the modes of work. Um, so let's see, Jennifer, did I just have thoughts on the, that you heard in these other, Jennifer Gordon this time. So now we have two Jennifers. Um, well I'll, I'll close the circle because I'll start with Jennifer Bear. So okay. um, I, I, actually to what you said uh, after Jen Bear finished talking, which is at least there are people doing something, right, in, in terms of optimism. And that to me is a core tension, but a productive one in this project. That is, we're committed to these large theories as our analytical tools, right? World systems theory, racial capitalism, distributional analysis. But at the same time, and I just, this really stood out to me in the different presentations, we're all struggling to also recognize that they don't actually totalize in a close look at what's happening on the ground. Um, and so in the story I tell, in Vanya's chapter, in Jen Baer's chapter, in Elena and Jorge's chapter, right, there's, there's a lot going on that's really complicated uh in the moment and that also complicates the theories uh and that to me is where i can find some optimism in what really is a, a set of very difficult situations um it, and um and i think i'll leave it there yeah i mean so the, you know the great puzzle how can things be systemic and predictable on the one hand and plastic and open to agency and change on the other um, and also comprehensible and completely open to being remade and reimagined by people as they confront them and don't know how they're supposed to be. So that kind of dynamic that comes with these human complex human structures is what we're all trying to get our minds around. Um, Vanya, last thoughts? Thank you. So I was thinking both, I mean, everyone's paper here really resonates with me in so many different ways. It's so wonderful that we are coming from such different perspectives here. There are so many, you know, meeting points, at least as far as I can see so far, that where we can really, you know, learn from one another in, in certain structured ways, which is really surprising to me, given the, the, the great diversity of disciplinary approaches and also temporalities that we engage. So there's something, you know, quite hopeful about this project, it seems to me, despite not much of a hopefulness left in the world today. So with respect to Karen and Sam's paper, for example, you know, I was thinking I was going to ask this question uh, right after they finished, is temporality to them essential to the various concepts of work and the overarching project of racial capitalism? And then if so, how, right? And so what struck me is precisely the question of the pandemic, right? Both, so the question that comes out of it is really, you know, how do we square between the quotidian and exceptional supposedly forms of dispossession and crisis that racial capitalism produces? And so, you know, in temporalities of work in places like Austin might be, you know, perhaps, you know, thought of as, as nodal points of, of different forms of both formal and informal labor and labor's temporality is given, you know, but also in spite of the highly racialized labor and migration dynamics that they note. And maybe some of these might, you know, in temporality, different ways of do, uh, understanding both labor and, 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 and one's position in time could disrupt the actual linearity of progressive growth. And then finally, you know, given that Tesla is mentioned and, and the anxieties, as Sam said, right, there are some, you know, anxieties of an extreme form of futurism and, and Elon Musk really represents in that case, a villain of our futurities par excellence that come quite, you know, interesting in terms of what, what's brought to bear in a place like Austin. And then in Neville's uh, extremely illuminating notes on the future's past, uh, with, which of course, you know, much of my work chimes, uh, uh, he mentions tropes with long popular cultural life. And it's precisely uh, some of those insurrectionary remnants that survived 
a systemic will to disappear in, in the colonial and post-colonial archive. And I have some like that touches, for instance, in Bukil Napan tales in colonial and antebellum Louisiana. So it's exactly these, you know, abiding gender and sex, sometimes transgressive West African tropes, such as that of the hyena, Buki, that, 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 that are illuminating, in fact, and that survived the violence of the colonial uh, archive. So, you know, so to me, then what comes out of that is the question of what and who and when is the archive of work. And that, to me, is quite answered beautifully and interestingly in Neville's work. I mean, this whole question of, I mean, I. I understand temporality in a really simple way, um, which is there's a distribution of who lives in the present and who lives in the past. That's part of the way we imagine things. So right there in Austin, there are people who are living in the future and people who are living in the present and people who are living in the past. And that conditions as we imagine it is they are encouraged to imagine themselves um, just as between the North the third hemisphere and other parts of the world, there's an idea of who lives in the present and who lives in, in the always becoming or not yet there yet. So that those kinds of structures really inhabit work. Um, there are the people who are doing the work of the future and there are people who are doing the work of the past. And a lot of times value is distributed that way. Gender is organized around work in that way. There, it's a it's a powerful idea that in our moment, the present and the past are with us in our neighbors doing different things. And how does that get organized? And how does that help sustain um, inequalities that we find unjust or unsatisfying? Neville, thoughts as you heard the other papers? Then I'm going to turn to Karen to help us kind of put all the pieces together. You're, going to, you're muted though, Neville. <laughs> I'm, I mean, the muting might be metaphoric as well, because I'm sort of overwhelmed by the array of approaches, thoughts, archives that we're trying to assemble um, into creating a new imaginary or a new set of um, methodologies for thinking about work. I mean, I think what, one of the things I learned from all these papers is that the that work itself or labor itself is overdetermined um, and that it's often a, a, a kind of relational category. So it's caught, but I mean, in Jennifer Gordon's paper, it's just, it's, it's fascinating to me how actually, okay. So work is imagined as a solution to the humanitarian crisis of the Syrian refugees, but the figuring of the Syrian refugees as a humanitarian crisis gets a whole lot of other geopolitical factors, the causes of the war um, off the hook. And so, so I think what I learned there, and I also learned the same thing from Jennifer Baer's paper, is these specific instances of work, actually, if when we start looking at their determinations and overdeterminations, kind of recoup a whole powerful set of analyses around governance, the economy, that, that, that actually the, the, I mean, and maybe this is just because I'm a, a crypto Blake and that, you know, you could see the world in a grain of sand, but I think you could see, and the Austin example, I mean, to, to come back to what Kerry was saying about the salience of dispossession, I mean, the historical layering of dispossession in that, in the Austin example, um, in an earlier meeting, I don't know if Nina, Nina is still here, is like, okay, so we, we've got the, the, the first colonial dispossession, then we've got the 1928 um, attempt to force all uh, Latinx and Black people east of the highway. Um, so I think these are, I mean, I'm just trying to distill what we can take from these powerful instances of thinking on the ground. Um, and what those mean for, 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 a, for a, an analytic that can try to get at some of the complexity of the future of work. Um, I also, I want to ask Vanya, okay, so, so how, I mean, I imagine when you, you're looking at a kind of slave ledgers or a census document, where, and is there a gender category? Is it just left blank? Is it, I mean, how, how, do, how does official demark this? It's exactly that. It's just the category on a ledger. Uh, 
and sometimes there's nothing on it where there should be sex. And sometimes there's F and sometimes there's M. And when there is nothing, oftentimes the 20th century, at least historians would then assume on the basis of one's name, what might be the sex or gender of the person concerned. But it's, it's strange to say the least that some of the data is missing or otherwise very you know, detailed uh, ledger of such kind. One of the things that struck me is you now based on what you were just saying about Jennifer Gordon's paper, having done some work in the in Brussels in the EU, I can just picture what a eureka moment it was to think this up. Yeah. So here are all these migrants, it's like a threefer, right? So here are all these migrants coming, and then there's Jordan, and then there's textiles and work and we'll pay the Jordanians to put these people to work in textile factories and then we won't have to use Bangladesh as much I mean so it was like a every problem solved in an instant and so another thing that that I think um, bears some scrutiny is the way in which an idea of a solution comes to seem the obvious solution of the moment for people who are in the position to make changes. So there are people, you know, we call them the leadership elite or whatever there, but people who are able to deploy money and get governments to do things or corporations to do things. And all of a sudden they think that's the thing to do. So, um, so I heard a, a yesterday an NPR podcast with these people who are claiming that the new thing every corporation needs is a, is a global sustainability manager or something like that. that it's gone from a can have to a must have for corporations as a way of, uh, but then some other things like that would be the moment in the United States under trade pressure, when the so obvious progressive solution was to retrain American workers from manufacturing to high tech. So that idea that you could jump from old style manufacturing to new style manufacturing by retraining the workers in the whole series of programs. And then, you know, you want, one wonders about the moment of thinking labor organizing in the union was the way in which you were gonna rebalance countervailing power between capital and labor. And that those were the forces that were structuring what it meant to work and everything that was left out of that. Um, as Carrie reminded us right at the beginning. So I'm, I'm actually particularly interested in the the ways in which a leadership group or a society's dominant narrative comes to have an understanding not only of what is and isn't a problem, but of what's an obvious solution that how could you possibly not think that was a really good idea. Um, but anyway, so we've had lots of things on the table. We're just about out of time. Um, but Karen, I, first of all, what did you hear in these things? And how would you put the pieces together? Just take a few minutes to try to stitch it all up if you can. Um, well, stitching it up would be impossible, <laughs> and especially in one minute. So um, I'm, I'm actually gonna start by thanking everybody um, for the amazing presentations, but also for being a part of this project, um, which is, you know, it's been, we, as David said at the beginning, we've been doing it for two years and it's really fun to see how the papers have, have, have moved and how we've all moved in thinking about issues. And so I, that's a transition maybe into, I did see some, I saw some things that I hadn't, I don't know if they were totally new, but I, I hadn't seen them articulated or they hadn't come together in the same way for me before. And part of it is that, including about my own paper, that I mean, I, I with with Sam is that really all of these papers are about development and about political economy and about the ways in which whatever sites we're looking at really define themselves and 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 sort of brand themselves. Um, so I, as as you were just saying about Jennifer Gordon's paper, I mean, it's quite explicit there as a. I mean, it's how to deal with refugees, but it's an idea about development. Um, and of course, in Elena and Jorge's paper on the palm industry in Colombia, the, that's played so much a big role and was pushed by the World Bank early on, both in terms of thinking about climate change um, and in, because there was an idea that certain land was supposed to be conserved and then 
um, that being used eventually by the palm industry in ways that is very much endorsed um, officially. But, and of course, with the, those political economies come different forms of racialization and dispossession, past, present, and future. Um, but I guess what I was hearing in the others too is that, as I said, every space had that. So for Jen Bears, right, the, it's the milk industry in Vermont um, is, is so central, even if the ways in which it's changed over time, the workers who have been involved have shifted. Um, obviously, we talked about the branding of the progressive um, boomtown in Austin. Um, Vanya, New Orleans, uh, slavery was a political economy, but so was the was was and is right the red light district. So formal and informal. Um, I can't quite do it with Neville's. Um, there were uh, there, but there were different political economies behind each of those um, dystopian or utopian. Um, ideas. So, you know, I think with that, we don't, I mean, that's, that's perhaps suggesting that the role of social movements, um, whether they're made up of workers, non-wage workers, um, non-workers, uh, the, the role that I think it'd be, it, it's, I, I've been sitting here thinking about what, what, what would the role be if we made it more explicitly about trying to shift um, political economy, um, because I think we usually think that's something that policymakers do, um, as a, as opposed to happening at the social movement level. Um, so that's not wrapping it up by any means. That's just one slice. But everybody had terrific, terrific slices um, on on these chapters, and uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing that book. Um, <laughs> Well, we'll have, one, one would have to write it first, I suppose. Um, Karen, thanks very much. Thanks to the Rappaport Center. I just wanted to thank you, David, before you. And thanks to me. Thank me. <laughs> it's the Institute for Global Policy because these networks have been very connected and we've been working on this for a long time. So, and you Great did. conversation, all of you. Thanks so much for sharing your work with us. Thanks to all of you for coming and join us. Thus endeth the session. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>